welcome to another edition of the Prince Soft Cover. Today we have with us Nawab Shafat Ali Khan, who is uh, a, a con- who describes himself as a conservationist and also as a famous authorized hunter who is called in by state governments when they need to control dangerous wild animals. Uh, today, the book that we will be talking about is Avni Inside the Hunt for India's Deadliest Man Eater. So this was a really, really gripping read. It was very interesting. Uh, the way you decided to narrate the story is to talk about all of your various encounters and interweave that with, uh, you know, Operation T1, which was ultimately how your team was able to put down uh, the man-eating tigress T1, who also came to be known as Avni. Um, so. You know, but before you get into those stories, you kind of give us your own bird's eye view of the conservation scene in India. You talk about how um, certain policies like Project Tiger, when it was first conceived, didn't lack essential information. Um, can you talk a little bit about that, about your views on, on those initial policies? You see, uh, basically, my book is aimed at uh, eliminating the uh, man-animal conflict that is staring in the face today in our country. And uh, I have tried to delve deep into what are the issues that are leading to so many man killings, so much of suffering, so much of agony uh, among the forest dwellers who are every day in direct Con- confrontation with wildlife. So when I was analyzing these aspects, uh, I realized that uh, Project Tiger, which was initiated in 1973, uh, uh, when that was envisaged and planned, we, uh, the government at that point of time, did not sort of plan as to what they would do with more and more tigers. Because the land mass is constant. Human population is growing. Now, in this scenario, uh, the only common sense solution which appeals to me is to have animals that we can sustain. In certain pockets, if tigers increase or if elephants increase, then they are going to get into human landscape, human areas, and create more and more problems, not only for the government, but also for the people who are living around our national parks and forests. So my book tries to analyze these aspects, and there is a message that uh, how we could get over this problem in the days to come. So yes, that's that is a theme that you 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 sort of talk about how there's a combination of uh, you know this growing tiger population, uh, incompetence on the field, and well-intentioned but misguided policies that kind of are leading to this rise in human and animal conflict. And you also argue that there is an urgent need for forest-dwelling communities who bear the brunt of these. Uh, encounters for them to be better protected. So can you tell us a bit about how, your own experiences? How have you seen that pan out? And yeah. Well, the situation at ground zero is extremely serious. Uh, not a day passes when we hear news reports of people getting killed from elephants, getting killed by tigers, wild boar attacking, blue bull ravaging agricultural crops. So this has become a daily affair in our country. And uh, it is, I personally feel that things have gone completely out of hand. And now it's a rather uphill task for the government to control the situation. And uh, today with science and WhatsApp, the news is no longer a secret. It spreads out very fast. And if a man is killed, then the neighboring villages 
towns, the entire district comes to know about it. And that triggers off an anti-wildlife wave, which is extremely dangerous as far as conservation is concerned. Because without the support in an overpopulated country like India, without the support of the locals, the forest dwellers, the farmers who are living around our national parks, it's impossible to have any scheme of conservation. So uh, it's very, very important that we carry all these people with us in all conservation programs. But when one stray tiger, a man-eater, steps out, like it happened in the case of Avani, where she terrorized 26 villages, there was no forest around. They were agricultural lands. And I don't blame the people. They were out working in their own fields. And there a tiger strays in and kills 13 people, throwing their lives out of gear, schools closed. So this is a very dangerous uh, situation. And it doesn't end with the end of the tigers. The anger, paranoid villagers are out to poison and kill every tiger that walks. So this, according to me, is a very, very dangerous phenomenon. And the government and all of us together have to work hard to, to sort of solve this issue at ground zero. So one of the sort of most tense, I think, parts of the book is when you describe uh, going into the forest, you and three other of your teammates, and uh, you were stranded there because the jeep broke down and you had no network, you had you know, no radio uh, network either. And so you and another teammate decided to walk on foot to try and find some network, but the sun was setting. And at that time, you both of you encountered D1, Avni, in the forest, just as your torch light was dimming. So how did you get out of that situation? How did you manage to keep your cool in that situation? If you can explain to us. Well, you see, all man-eating tigers or rogue elephant operations are extremely dangerous. And uh, uh, we take our life in our hands when we are in these operations. And even the department, when they have exhausted all remedies, 12 failed tranquilizing attempts, and then we are called. So it's, it's uh, I would say, the most risky sport, if I may call it sport in the world, going after a man on foot. And uh, we do take these chances. And um, of course, it was a very frightful night. Even now, I get nightmares when I think of that night, that dark night where our vehicle broke down and um, uh, Lakshman was with me, my forest guard. And uh, it was uh, extremely dangerous. We had no option. We had to walk those four kilometers to base camp. And it was very, very scary. But that's just a tip of an iceberg. There have been several occasions in the book where T1 charged at us. And you see, seeing a tiger in a zoo or a park or from the safety of a vehicle is totally different from encountering a tiger on foot when there is no barricade in between the man eater and you. And these are not normal animals. I wouldn't mind stalking a normal tiger in a national park because they shy away. Tiger normally shies away when they see man. But in, when we are uh, after man eaters, it's a different ball game altogether. Here, the man eater may charge and also like to make a meal out of us. So we have to be extremely careful. Like Jim Corbett said that 100 years ago, that shooting a man eater is like climbing the Everest. So these are extremely difficult and dangerous operations that we uh, undertake. And uh, I would say it's the blessings of the villagers and so many people uh, that we 
come out safely out of every operation? Um, one thing that, you know, as I was reading the book and that I was curious about um, was also your, your own background, your own training, your own upbringing. You mentioned your father and your grandfather, but we don't really get to hear very much of that. So one, if you could give us an idea of that. And also two, why did you decide to leave that out of the book? You see, days have changed. 70 years ago, when Jim Corbett hunted man eaters, he was called a sportsman. He was called a gentleman shikari. And India's best national park, Corbett National Park, is named after him. But today things have changed because of deforestation, because of animals on the verge of extinction. Hunters are no, they no longer enjoy uh, that freedom and status that they once enjoyed. So, uh, but the, the bottom line is, even today with science and camera traps and technology, we still have to depend on traditional methods to track a man eater. This is what I learned from my grandfather and my father. And you will appreciate that all the operations that I have undertaken are after the government, the forest department, the National Tiger Conservation Authority, Wildlife Trust of India, all these nodal agencies, after they gave up and human killings continued, that we were called. So what is it we have? A handful, two or three trackers going into the forest, tracking a man-eater, and we end the operation in a limited period. This is traditional knowledge. Traditional knowledge of reading the Padmaks, reading the forest. This is what I have learned from my forefathers. And put it uh, in letter and spirit. And that is what we do on our daily rounds. And that is what I have inculcated in all the uh, more than 100 uh, uh, workshops that I have conducted for the forest department. Senior IFS officers, veterinarians, field staff, I have tried to inculcate this traditional knowledge into them so that in the days to come, they could manage these operations on their own. And now I'm glad most of the boys who were trained under me, like Maharashtra, uh, Chandrapur, who could never tranquilize an animal. Now they are tranquilizing even a small target like a monkey. They are able to dart them. So this is what gives me a lot of satisfaction that our training, our traditional knowledge has actually come into conservation today. The book is also takes a very critical uh, stance or is very critical of conservationists and activists. Um, I wanted to ask, don't you think it is important that conservationists and activists uh, speak up? I mean, what role, isn't it? Don't you think they do have an important role in wildlife conservation? And also, uh, I did read that there were conservationists as well who, who did, you know, um, support the PCCF's decision to allow the shooting to happen. Well, I wouldn't call all of them black sheep. There are certain organizations, NGOs, which are definitely doing good work for the forest department. There are two things here. Doing good work for the forest and wildlife in normal circumstances is totally different than interfering in the forest department work in a specific operation, dangerous operation, which involves a man -eater. So here, our experiences, only as far as the man are concerned, because when we are called and we are working there, 
the uh, what you call we are working on the orders of the department i am only the hangman the chief wildlife warden of the state has already given the hanging order my work is to execute that order i am not the deciding authority whether p1 is to be killed or captured or caged that's not my job the decision has already been taken by the chief wildlife warden of the state ratified by the high court and in this case ratified by the supreme court so my job is only of a hangman there is no point in blaming a hangman you get my point so here in this case what has happened is lot of vested interests nowadays i'm sorry to say that there are some activists who get funds from abroad who have vested interests who who want to make make a name for themselves so it's more than the actual avani which is in question but it's to get them into the to the mainstream and make a name for themselves they file false cases in courts file false affidavits to give you an example an affidavit was filed in nagpur high court that human killings are not by t1 wild dogs hyenas and uh, wild boar are killing people there is no scientific evidence that t1 is killing people in spite of the fact that there was dna confirmation that t1 saliva was found in the human bodies now my question is after azgar shot t1 on 18th of november then what happened suddenly human killing stopped so by filing these false affidavits misguiding the honorable courts and leading to stay orders believing these court orders when the high court of nagpur stayed a shootout of avani four more people died so just imagine the only earning member of a family is killed for no fault of his he is working in his field it's not your case that he has encroached into any forest he is ploughing his two acres of land and living there and the tiger strays into his property and kills him what happened to that family is there any one to take up their cause their life is ruined the girl whom i have dedicated this book to she was a, a comfortable lady living now she is working as a daily laborer to educate her children who is there to to uh, listen to them isn't there any accountability filing a false affidavit before a high court and then it's all now in black and white after avani was killed no human killings happened so time has silenced my critics so these are people whom i feel are working against conservation their agenda is something different this should not be allowed to happen in a in a democracy is what i feel so speaking of the operation um both you and your son uh, have expressed regret when it comes to how it sort of happened and you do say that uh, you know there was a conspiracy to kind of sabotage your the operation i don't want to spoil it for our readers so i won't get into what that was but um you know why do you think one is how would you have how did you envision the operation to go and secondly why do you think that there was a motivation or a conspiracy to sabotage that effort see what happened in avani's case was there were far too many vested interests young vets want a name for themselves in spite of the fact 
that there were 12 failed tranquilizing attempts. And when I was away in Bihar, Asghar was alone. And Avani had two cubs. Now, a tigeress with cubs, a man eater, is not a normal animal. The, the tigeress with cubs at heel are extremely possessive and angry. And when they smell an alien tiger, that triggers off a territorial aggression and they become extremely angry. Now, surely the vets knew about this. And without the sanction of higher authorities, a urine of another tigeress was smuggled from another district and sprinkled there. What was the motive? Was it to sabotage the operation? Was it to see that Azhar and his team would be attacked by the tigeress? I don't see any bona fides in this except malafides. So, and this, they have admitted this in black and white before the NTCA in their own handwritings later on. So, this is something which never happened in my 40 years of man-eating operations. We were part of the operation, authorized. So, when the doctors and Azgar, when I was not there, Azgar was part of the operation. It was the moral responsibility for each and everyone to share what they were doing. Asghar was very transparent. Everyone knew where he was going, what he was doing. So that was expected of all the other team members, which didn't happen. And here, arming the enemy, making the enemy angry, a risk to life, Asghar's team, Asghar and his team were in the risk of life and death. Apart from that, I don't see any other uh, uh, genuine motive in getting urine and sprinkling it. And then they vanished from the scene. When Avani became aggressive that evening, which was a bazaar day, it was Ralegaon weekly Shandy Bazaar. There were thousands of people on the road. Three human kills had happened there. To sprinkle an alien tigeress's urine there and make Avani more aggressive was nothing but to sabotage the operation. This is what I have tried to highlight. How would you have liked the operation to go? I would have been very happy if T1 would have been tranquilized. We have tranquilized tigers in the past. We have tranquilized man-eaters in the past. And uh, Avni would have been tranquilized. But for this uh, uh, ploy and plot, uh, Avni would have, Azgar was bent upon tranquilizing her. We had seen her a few times before, but we didn't pull the trigger at her. She was a beautiful tigeress. And at this stage of my life, having spent 40 years on conservation, gives me much more pleasure if I save an animal rather than kill it. How can, how can um, a tiger like a man-eating tiger or leopard or a rogue elephant, once they're captured, how can they be rehabilitated? What is the next step after that? Well, they generally go in for life imprisonment in a zoo or a rescue center. It's a sad state of affairs and uh, it's very difficult to release them. Uh, the Maharashtra Forest Department tried to release a man-eating tigeress that I captured in Brahmapuri with a radio collar and then she killed some more people and again orders were issued to sort of uh, capture her. So once they become man-eaters, it's uh, very, very difficult to uh, keep them in captivity and, and, you know, sort of, uh, they cannot be released again in the wild. They cannot be released in the wild again. I guess my last question is, what are some of the lessons that you drew from Operation T1 and also that you think the Forest Department can, can draw from, from this massive operation? 
Well, with the rising conflict day to day, there are a lot of lessons that can be learned uh, from the Avani's episode. Number one, a lot of surveillance and exercise has to be uh, maintained on the staff because uh, in this particular case, the matter was so serious that the government of Maharashtra had authorized the chief wildlife warden, who is the head of the state uh, as far as wildlife is concerned. His headquarters was changed from Nagpur to Yavatmal, and he was camping there. In spite of the fact that the chief wildlife warden and his deputy were physically camping in Yavatmal, uh, all this happened right under his nose. So these are things which have to be prevented in the days to come. And uh, second thing is, National Tiger Conservation Authority has no guidelines to end the operation in a particular time frame. There must be a time frame in which a man-eating a tiger has to be captured, trapped, caged, or as a last resort shot. Operations cannot go on and on. Avani, if you see, had terrorized those 26 villages for two and a half years. Surely this cannot happen today. Those days of Jim Corbett and Kenneth Anderson are over. Today, we have to act fast and within a week or at the most 10 days, a managing operation should end. Human beings cannot be sacrificed indefinitely. Not from the point of human killing, but from the point of revenge killing. Man killing triggers off a wave of revenge killings. Today, we are losing many tigers. I think Maharashtra, I think we have lost about 34, 35 tigers out of revenge killing. Manitas are only 1% of the total number of tigers in the country. So they have to be taken out of the system as soon as possible. That's my strong message in this book. And we have to, we have to fence our parks. Wild animals cannot be allowed to stray out of the core and buffer forests. There is no place for a tiger in a human landscape where there are hospitals, children, elephants roaming around, tigers walking across. This cannot happen in any civilized society. The forest department, the government of India have to take a hard decision all national parks and forests have to be fenced. All the animals which are outside have to be captured and put inside. Human beings should not enter the forests and wild animals should not come out. In an overpopulated country like India, we have to save the masses if we want to save our wildlife. Otherwise, the day is not far when paranoid and angry farmers, forest dwellers, will annihilate the entire wildlife of our country. So do you not see that, I mean, do you think that forest dwelling communities or communities who interact with wildlife often, is there no way to mend that relationship? That stage is over. As I told you, when the only earning member of a family gets killed by a stray man eater, you can't talk reason to that family. You can't. I have tried very hard. Now, if you go into Yavatmal and try to reason out with people that they have to coexist with that they have to coexist with wild animals, they will not even give you a glass of water. That stage is over. Tempers are running high. Farmers are losing their crops. There are lakhs of blue bull, lakhs of wild boar outside the forest in agricultural lands. 
I am working in Bihar now. People have farmers have given up farming because of blue bull. How can we talk anything uh, reason out with those families? A lot of water has flown under the bridge. It's a it's a very difficult uphill task for our government to get the situation back to normal. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for speaking with us. And thank you for watching. For more videos like this one, do subscribe to The Print.